Welcome to Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, where today, for the 114th time, college sports' great sibling rivalry will play out. Army versus Navy. It is a game of great pageantry, showcased best by the march on of the Army Corps of Cadets and Naval Brigade of Midshipmen before the game. It is a moment that CBS Sports Network is proud to bring you now. The Army Navy Live March On, presented by USAA. It's been played 113 times and is a rivalry like no other. Together they defend the nation we love, but on this day, allies become adversaries. Throw out the records because this game is about pride and passion. The mantras, go Army, beat Navy, and go Navy, beat Army, are ingrained from day one. Bragging rights are on the line. From the city of brotherly love, it's Army, Navy, the purest rivalry in all of sports. Welcome to Philadelphia, the Brigade of Midshipmen and the Army Corps. the last time it's it's a fabulous game it, it, it's everything that's right this really and truly are the best and the brightest when it comes to our young American youth and, and, and the way that they go into this game all the students and I would say the students never really they don't age they just <laughs> sort of aren't eligible to play anymore and, and I was with a lot of them last night army guys that were so excited for this game and a lot of those students end up being the fans who are filing in here nice and early you know there's been a lot of complaining about a cold weather Super Bowl but I don't hear any complaining here among the army and Navy contingency isn't that strange yeah, yeah this this isn't football weather I'm sorry <laughs> 72 slight breeze this is stuff these are this is adversity this is just another thing to overcome of course, the march on will be coming up in just a few minutes. Many great Americans will be joining us here, including General Ray Ordierno, the chief of the Army. Uh, we will send it back out to Brent and the guys after this break on the Army Navy live march on. Mine was. Inside College Football Army-Navy March On on CBS Sports Network is being brought to you by USAA, proudly serving the financial needs of current and former military members and their families. It's a series that's been going since 1890, and one of the great traditions in all of sports as we look at the top ground attacks. Hey, Auburn's going to play for national title, so that says a little something. Army at number two, Navy at number three in the country in running the football. Welcome back outside of Lincoln Financial Field. Aaron, we turn to you for Army in their ground game led by Terry Baggett. Yeah, no question that Army runs the football and is running back by committee, but by far the most productive running back for the Knights has been Terry Baggett. Over 1,000 yards this year, 8.25 yards per carry. Remember that game he had against Eastern Michigan where he had 300 plus yards and four touchdowns? They need a game out of him like that today, but it's most important that he protects the football, fellas, because turnovers were the story in last year's game, so Baggett needs to be sure-handed. That 304 against Eastern Michigan, most in Army history, he's at 8.2 yards per carry, eight touchdowns, over 1,000 yards. On the other side for Navy, They've got the ability to run and throw because of the sophomore Keenan Reynolds. No doubt about it. Keenan Reynolds, what an athlete, what a quarterback, what a leader. This guy can run the football. They, they, two good running teams, but the thing that Keenan can do, he can throw the football. You see the post corner right here, right on time. They mix it up very good with running pass. He's thrown for over 1,000 yards, eight, touch, eight touchdowns, and also they can run the ball and he's responsible for 26 touchdowns. This guy's a difference maker. What about the San Jose State game? 240 on the ground for Reynolds, seven touchdowns. Also had 226 on the ground against Hawaii. We are leading you up to the march on with the Army Corps of Cadets and the Brigade of Midshipmen when we come back.
I'm General Ray Odierno, Chief of Staff for the United States Army here at the United States Military Academy. Whether four deployed in the Middle East, the Asia Pacific region, and in nearly 150 countries around the world, we are part of a joint team working together to defend this great nation. On one day a year, the Army meets the Navy on the fields of friendly strife. This year on December 14th, we'll celebrate the most famous rivalry in college football. I'm proud to be part of this great rivalry, and you should be too. So when we step on the field in Philadelphia, I want you all to remember one thing. Go Army! Go Army! And we are under three hours away as Army tries to end this 11-game losing streak to arch-rival Navy. And as we get set for the Army-Navy march on to begin, we are joined by General Ray Ordierno, Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. And, sir, it is great to have you with us again here. Well, thanks. It's always great to be here. Uh, this has been a, a very busy football week for you, of course, Army-Navy now, and then winning the Distinguished American Award from the National Football Foundation earlier this week yeah. at the uh, Waldorf Astoria. Congratulations. Congratulations, Thank you. and th this has been a, a life full of football for you. Football set you on a path to West Point. It did. Uh, I tell everyone, if it was for football, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to West Point. Uh, back in 1971, Tom Cahill, the then head coach army, was sitting in my living room and offered me uh, the opportunity to play there. And I probably wouldn't have went to West Point if it wasn't for that. And the opportunity football gave me to get a great education, develop as a leader, has led me to where I am today. And that's what I try to remind everybody. That's what football and sports is about. It gives young men and, and women opportunities that they might not necessarily have. And that's what's important about it. I think we forget about that sometimes. General, what is your message to the football cadets today for this game? We talk a lot about these winning streaks and losing streaks. And we obviously the records mean nothing in, a, in, in this kind of a matchup. Well, what, what, you know, what, what I tell the young men and women, the, the men that are playing today is, you know, this is for the Army. But really, it, it's also for the academy. But it's for yourselves. Uh, you know, leave it on the field. This is a day you'll never forget. Uh, play as hard as you can uh, and, and just be able to look your, yourself in the mirror and say, I played as hard as I could, I gave everything I could, and everything will turn out okay. And I have a lot of belief and faith in these young men. They're great young men, and they'll do a great job today, and I think they're going to beat Navy today. The young men on the field, the young men and women in the stands, they, they chose their path as 9- and 10-year-olds, a lot of them saying yeah. that it was 9-11 that drove them yeah. to, to want to join the Army or the Navy. Yeah. This is also the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the famed Army-Navy game that followed it. Yeah. How, how did that game also inspire your path? Well, I was uh, 10 years old, and uh, I remember the game being delayed, how disappointed I was. And uh, when the game finally played, watching that game, and specifically Raleigh Stitchway, and I've told him this before personally, the way he played hard in the fourth quarter and the determination Army had, even though they ended up on the one-yard line and ended up losing to Roger Staubach and Navy, from that moment on, I wanted to be a cadet. I wanted to play football at West Point. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to West, you know, be part of the academy. And and then I got the opportunity, and it's incredible, you know. And that game it meant so much to the country at the time. It was the real first major event after the assassination of President Kennedy, and it brought the country together. And I think it was appropriate that it was the uh, Army and Navy that were playing in that game. And. You know, 50 years later, it's still important. It's a, it's a great game. I'm so happy we've moved it to a day where it's the only really major game on. So the country gets to enjoy watching these great student athletes play. Uh, General, you and the Army ha have spearheaded a lot of the research that's gone on into concussion and hand injuries, yeah. along with the NFL also. Uh, but you brought up a great point the other morning when I saw you about let's remember the, the positive things that sports bring and the positive yeah. things that football brings. Yeah, what I worry about is it's, it's obviously important safety and, you know, the college game, high school game, pro game. But we got to remember sports develops qualities in our young men that are important, especially football, teamwork mental and physical toughness, resiliency. We, there's a lot of good things, and it gives young men and women opportunities to do things they might not get to do. It gives them a chance to get a college education. It gets them a chance to go to a premier institution. And we should remember that, that it does play a role. And very few people become pro athletes. Most of them contribute in thousands of different ways around our country, uh, whether it be in business or whether it be in local communities. We should never forget that. Or as a general helping the U.S. capture Saddam Hussein, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, 10 years ago yesterday, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was. Uh, 
you know, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it, and it's, it, obviously people brought it up this week, but that was an important time for us. I thought it was important because uh, we, we didn't want him to be running loose in that country because this, this country is so terrified of him, so I'm glad we were able to capture him. General, we appreciate your time. We are now going to listen to Cadet Cord Roberts as the U.S. Military Academy Corps of Cadets marches onto the field. Good morning, Army fans, and welcome to the annual Army-Navy Football Classic. The Corps of Cadets from the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, and members of the United States Army Cadet Command are beginning their traditional march on, representing their show of force in support of the Army football team. Entering the stadium is the United States Military Academy Band under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Jim Keene with the Drum Major, Sergeant Major Christopher D. Jones. The marches that will be played as cadets march onto the field are the official West Point March, American Exultant, Benny Havens, Alma Mater March, Army Blue, the Thunderer, and National Emblem. Let's go, Let's go, Leading the four regiments of the United States Corps of Cadets onto the field is the Brigade Commander, Cadet First Captain Lindsay Danilak from Montville, New Jersey. Her staff consists of the Deputy Brigade Commander, Cadet Captain Marcos Magana from Fresno, California. The Brigade Executive Officer, Cadet Captain Chelsea Sapperman from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The Brigade Adjutant, Cadet Captain Ted Kostich Jr. from Thompson Town, Pennsylvania. The Brigade Intelligence Officer, Cadet Captain Rebecca Tummers from Palmdale, California. The Brigade Operations Officer, Cadet Captain Jack Moreno from Las Cruces, New Mexico. The Brigade Information Systems Officer, Cadet Captain Kelly Washington from Silver Spring, Maryland. And the Brigade Command Sergeant Major, Cadet Command Sergeant Major Alexander Kanachi from Culver, Indiana. Since the days of the American Revolution, flag bearers have been an important element in ceremonies, leading today's formation and bearing the national colors United States Corps Cadets Color Guard, led by Cadet Color Sergeant Court Thompson from Templeton, California. The 1st Regiment is commanded by Cadet Captain Aaron Malden from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The Regimental Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Austin Bora from Chatham, New Jersey. The 1st Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Hong Shim Kwok from Linwood, Washington. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Sarah Downey from Hudson, North Carolina. Company A is commanded by Cadet Captain Andrew Brimer from Spotsylvania, Virginia. The First Sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant John Zeidler from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Company B is commanded by Cadet Captain Victor Ripley from Richmond, Virginia. The First Sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant James Gardner from Austin, Texas. Company C is commanded by Cadet Captain Victoria Wallach from Martell, Iowa. The First Sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Brian McLaughlin from East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. The 2nd Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Chad Llewellyn from Frederick, Maryland. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Nolan Anderson from Chicago, Illinois. Company D is commanded by Cadet Captain Adam Gebner from Naperville, Illinois. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Richard Mayorga from Houston, Texas. Company E is commanded by Cadet Captain Kevin Keyes from Westboro, Massachusetts. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Kenneth Seaman from New Milford, Pennsylvania. Company F is commanded by Cadet Captain Kelly Lewis from Somerville, South Carolina. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Alexander Smith from Playstow, New Hampshire. The 
third battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Zachary Pulega from Antino, Illinois. The battalion command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Niels Olson from Framingham, Massachusetts. Company G is commanded by Cadet Captain Zach Bowers of Covington, Georgia. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Garrett Rose of Fort Smith, New Hampshire. Company H is commanded by Cadet Captain Nate Billison of Westchester, Ohio. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Nicholas Chisholm from Atlanta, Georgia. Company I is commanded by Cadet Captain Theodore I. Baker from Renoke, Virginia. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Charles Martin from Conway, Arkansas. The second regiment is commanded by Cadet Captain Steven Sachensky from Sleepy Hollow, New York. The, reg the regimental command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Louis Tabergi from Hebron, Kentucky. The first battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Matthew Smith from Westchester, Pennsylvania. The battalion command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Andrea Bagley from Thomasville, Alabama. Company A is commanded by Cadet Captain Naomi McGonagall from Granbury, Texas. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Joseph Cotton from Wayne, Illinois. Company B is commanded by Cadet Captain Daniel Sprouse from Fishers, Indiana. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Michael Altonji from Glenview, Illinois. Company C is commanded by Cadet Captain Megan Borden from Pueblo, Colorado. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant John Lascara from Edwardsville, Illinois. The second battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain James Pico from Portland, Maine. The battalion command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Christopher Dante from San Diego, California. Company D is commanded by Cadet Captain Russell Bowers from Charlotte, North Carolina. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Elizabeth Olsees from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Company E is commanded by Cadet Captain Mitch Platman. From Portland, Oregon. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Raziel Shields from Mason, New Hampshire. Company F is commanded by Cadet Captain Tyler Williams from Orlando, Florida. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Megan Forbes from East Petersburg, Pennsylvania. The third battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Alan Newman from Egan, Minnesota. The battalion command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Patrick Monfort from Rensselaer, Indiana. Company G is commanded by Cadet Captain Andrew Lott from Emporia, Kansas. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Alexander Klopton from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Company H is commanded by Cadet Captain Mark Myers in Satellite Beach, Florida. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Eris Wilkins from Yongsong, Korea. Company I is commanded by Cadet Captain Bobby Panchishin III from Downington, Pennsylvania. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Michael Che from Honolulu, Hawaii. The third regiment is commanded by Cadet Captain J.U. from Wyckoff, New Jersey. The regimental command sergeant major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major John Crusetti from Mooresville, North Carolina. The 1st Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Andrew DeFabio from Stockton, California. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Daniel Murphy from Naperville, Illinois. Company A is commanded by Cadet Captain Christopher Schifoletti from Armonk, New York. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant John Worthington from Memphis, Tennessee. Company B is commanded by Cadet Captain Jared Hessler from Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Andrew Mitchell from Nina, Wisconsin. Company C is commanded by Cadet Captain Della Taylor from Redondo Beach, California. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Michael Tuffer from Yigo, Guam. The 
second battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Brandon Moore from Torrington, Connecticut. The battalion commands our major is Cadet Commands our major Josh Coleman from Montville, Maine. Company D is commanded by Cadet Captain Blake Bucknam from Boulder, Colorado. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Emily McManus from Hendersonville, Tennessee. Company E is commanded by Cadet Captain Matt Thompson from Ann Arbor, Michigan. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Joshua Cookson from Jacksonville, Florida. Company F is commanded by Cadet Captain John Temme from Damascus, Maryland. The first sergeant is Cadet First Sergeant Chloe Drummond from Birmingham, Alabama. The 3rd Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Christopher Horseman from Roswell, Georgia. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Cameron Ayala from Sarasota, Florida. Company G is commanded by Cadet Captain Ben Nichols from Benville, Arkansas. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Jamonte Little from Seabrook, South Carolina. Company H is commanded by Cadet Captain Andrew Blood from South Glen Falls, New York. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant John Sharp from Jackson, Tennessee. Company I is commanded by Cadet Captain Alec Kukarski from Coral Springs, Florida. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Richard Mendoza from Pico Rivera, California. The 4th Regiment is commanded by Cadet Captain Ian McPherson from Bellamede, New Jersey. The Regimental Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major William Wong from Newport News, Virginia. The 1st Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Gordon Stock from Chillington, Pennsylvania. Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Andrew Trahan from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Company A is commanded by Cadet Captain Joseph Nyan from Hampton, New Hampshire. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant John Werner from Livingston, New Jersey. Company B is commanded by Cadet Captain Jeff Lesmeister from Anoka, Minnesota. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Michael Janowski from Plano, Texas. Company C is commanded by Cadet Captain Edward Mills from Spangle, Washington. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant J. Dusan from Davis, California. The 2nd Battalion is commanded by Cadet Captain Connor Love from Portland, Oregon. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Christian Hill from Ardsley, New York. Company D is commanded by Cadet Captain Swayze Brown from Boyce Ranch, Texas. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Edward Kelly from Norristown, Pennsylvania. Company E is commanded by Cadet Captain Juliet Wallerstein from Southbury, Connecticut. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Andrew Zecca from Rockville, Maryland. Company F is commanded by Cadet Captain Matthew Shinkwood from Modesto, California. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Roger Diaz from Houston, Texas. is commanded by Cadet Captain Andrew College from Rockville, Maryland. The Battalion Command Sergeant Major is Cadet Command Sergeant Major Zach Harnish from Kettering, Ohio. Company G is commanded by Cadet Captain Jenna Versalone from Lincoln, Massachusetts. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Michael Salas from San Diego, California. Company H is commanded by Cadet Captain David Blum from El Dorado Hills, California. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Louis Beto from Danville, Kentucky. Company I is commanded by Cadet Captain Dana Vanderlei from Mobile, Alabama. The 1st Sergeant is Cadet 1st Sergeant Jason Hu from Seattle, Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Corps of Cadets.
Ladies and gentlemen, standing before you are the cadets of the United States Military Academy. Every one of them has chosen to answer the call to duty. With their salute, they recognize and honor your show's support. These cadets today will lead America's sons and daughters tomorrow in defense of our great nation. And now, Army fans, join the Corps as they cheer the Army team towards victory with the rocket. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the United States Corps of Cadets. The marches that are being played as the cadets exit the stadium are the official Army song, The Army Goes Rolling Along. Washington Post, on to victory, gridiron grenadiers. Americans, we, and on, brave old Army team. beginning its march off here in Philadelphia. And one of them joining us right now, Cadet Alex Jensen, a junior at West Point from Charlotte, North Carolina, and also the shortstop on the Army baseball team uh, joining me and Randy as, uh, as we watch this march on uh, from above here, uh, up on the flight deck, as it's called. Uh, Alex, not exactly baseball weather here for the uh, for the march on and this and this great Army-Navy game today. No, sir, not exactly, but uh, great football weather. Great football weather. And what, tell me, what is the mood on campus this week? I know you've been there now a few years as uh, the buzz picks up and everyone hopes that this streak comes to an end and Army gets the win. Uh, Army-Navy week, uh, notoriously, has always been uh, a week full of excitement, a lot of buzz around campus. Um, it doesn't matter how many tests you have because it's Army Navy week. You know, it's it's all around the core. So you heard a lot this week about Navy going through finals to get ready for this game. I know you guys have have finals next week. So is, is that any kind of an advantage in your mind? I'll tell you what. Um, no, I think it works in both sides. I think there's two sides of the coin, um, but hopefully they're a little worn out mentally uh, from last week's finals. Could be. Tell, tell us what inspired you to go to West Point and serve our country after your time at the academy is over. Oh, I think it's a unique opportunity. Um, something to be part of great, uh, be a part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, something different that not all my friends were doing. Uh, and to serve your country is one of the best things that you can, that you can do, so yeah. You're watching this game, you get a chance to watch this. What's it like interacting with the football players who are all also cadets? Are they treated any differently from any other cadets? Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're looked at just like uh, we all are. Um, you, know, you could be roommates with them. They're in the core, they're in the barracks, they live with us. Uh, they're all great guys. They're all really, really great guys. And I know we were talking before that you're from a, uh, not, not from a military family, Alex here is hoping that uh, Army can turn things around because one parent went to Alabama and so your dad went to Alabama and your mom went to Ohio State. So you gotta you gotta reverse it. Oh, that's right. Uh, it was a rough two weeks uh, with the family, but hopefully uh, the Army team can pull one out today. Uh, high hopes to turn that around. All right, Alex Jensen, we appreciate it. Good luck with all your all your future endeavors at the Academy and beyond, and thank you for thank your you time thank you and your much. service. Congratulations. Thank you. Enjoy the game. And uh, as the Army march off continues, uh, we will head to break. 
Very shortly, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, will join us as we watch Navy march on to the field here in Philadelphia. It is the Army-Navy Live March On, presented by USAA, here on CBS Sports Network. It is an eventful weekend here in Philadelphia. They're not just playing football, they're playing Patriot games all over town. Two groups of four from both Army and Navy having to do 25 push-ups, jump rope 50 times, and then, if they can, carry a 160-pound dummy, uh-oh, in a gurney up the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. The first team to get both groups up to the top would be the winner and get to raise both arms in victory like Rocky Balboa, whose statue was there, at least uh, in the movie. Navy won, by the way, and uh, that is fitting because the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, is with us now. And uh, No surprise that Navy won. Well, uh, it's become a theme here, and I know Army is going to look to end that uh, today on the football field. How are you, sir? You travel so much. I'm glad you were able to be here. Me too. I wouldn't miss this. Uh, this has been a, a special a special event for us to bring everyone the live march on, and uh, we have the cadets leaving now, and we'll have the midshipmen coming on shortly. H how special is it for you to be here every year? This, I think this is the best rivalry in college sports because it's one of the purest. Every one of these players on the field today are going to turn pro. And that's coming from an SEC that, guy. <laughs> well, they're... They're turning pro in defense of our country. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I live and die SEC football, no Miss football. But uh, this is this is special because of the young men who play this game and what they go through. They do all their military stuff. They do all the really tough educational stuff, and then they play Division One football. That's that's pretty special. And then when they finish, they go out and defend the rest of us. Mr. Secretary, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force play every single year the Commander-in-Chief trophy. Navy's had it back now for the last couple of years because they're guaranteed to retain it this year. What does that mean to the Corps, or to, the, to the midshipmen to have, actually have that trophy? Well, it's, it's a great honor, and it, it shows the teamwork that goes into being a mid to, to going to Annapolis. But, you know, I want to say a good word about the – the team on the other side because except for this one day one team one fight and army navy air force marines navy we're all in the same business here and uh this one day we can we can be parochial we can root for ourselves but we know that uh, when this game's over with we're going to be fighting together and you'll be uh, off to, to see more of the, uh, the the nearly one million people who are under your watch in both the Navy and the Marines. Uh, wh where have some of your recent travels been? Where will you be going soon? I just took my 12th trip to Afghanistan uh, to see the Marines and sailors who were, who were there doing such a magnificent job there. I stopped uh, a couple of other places, uh, Gutter, uh, Burundi where we have Marines uh, helping to train those, uh, those troops. And uh, I'm heading uh, to Mexico and then to the Pacific soon. Big man. <laughs> well, you know, one of the great aspects of this job is I get to go see sailors and Marines where we are. And we're a truly global Navy. We're a truly global Marine Corps. Today, during the game, are you sitting with a purely Navy group or do you sort of sit with a mixed crew, if you will? Well, we've got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs sitting with us in the first half. Okay. Of course, General Dempsey is Army and West Point, and we have a good-natured rivalry there. Uh, but one of the really cool things about my job, mm -hmm. Navy lets me go down on the sideline. So that's where I, I spend most of my time, being a sort of wannabe. You have a very uh, high-ranking pass, I suppose, for that, uh, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> well, so far they haven't kicked me out. <laughs> and, you know, and you love football, too. I mean, like you said, you, you were born in SEC country, went to Ole Miss. You went to the Ole Miss-Bama game earlier this year. Talk about the role that football plays in these young men's lives. I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff out there, not the kind of stuff you hear about on, on Army-Navy Day, but the kind of the role that, that, that this sport plays for these young men. Well, one of the things that you look at with these these young men that play for both Army, Navy, and Air Force is they play a very high level of Division One football. I mean, Navy's last three games, 
San Jose State, Notre Dame, and Pittsburgh. That is not an easy schedule. But at the same time, they do all the military stuff that's required of them at a service academy. They do all the the academic stuff that is required of them. In fact, Navy football players took their exams oh, this week. Big topic of discussion here. First time ever the week of the Army-Navy game. Yeah. We're not talking about rocks for jocks either. How, how much of a factor do you think something like that is, Mr. Secretary? I mean, it's, it can't you know, be easy. Well, it, it can't be easy, but, you know, they've learned to juggle this. They've learned to play Division One football and do all these other things. So I don't think uh, – I don't think you're going to see that big an impact. And it, these are always great games, are always close games. And uh, it's like I tell my friend, the Secretary of the Army, we're going to be humble about this. We're going to take it one decade at a time. Oh, boy. Talk about time management. <laughs> Decades and the hours in the day that the uh, all these midshipmen will be using to, to plan to study for their finals and then get out here on the football field. Uh, but before we now listen to the Navy march on, uh, what are some of the initiatives that you've been focusing on currently with our Navy, sir? Well, two, two big things. Besides taking care of our sailors and Marines, which is the most important things we do. One is moving the Navy and Marine Corps into different kinds of energy. Uh, it's a national security thing. We've got to get off fossil fuels. Uh, w the price spikes are just too much. We've had $2 billion in additional bills. So by 2020, at least half of our energy is going to be uh, come from non-fossil fuel sources. And the second thing is to uh, grow our fleet. Uh, we've, uh, we've got to have the, those big gray ships on the horizon to do what America needs to do all around the world. And I'm proud to say that uh, the four years before I got here, we put 19 ships under contract. In the last four years, we put 60 ships under contract with no more money. So uh, those are the things we've got to give the sailors and Marines the tools that they need to do the job. And uh, I think we're, uh, we're a long way down that road. They got some ships here in Philly, too. <laughs> They do. They're they're not uh, the readiest ships. That, uh, <laughs> in fact, my ship in the Navy was in Philadelphia. Now it's a museum in Buffalo. In Buffalo. In Buffalo. They, they probably took the long way to Buffalo to get it there. Yeah, yeah, how absolutely. the USS Little Rock ever got to Buffalo is beyond me. Well, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate all of your time. Uh, enjoy the the march on here by uh, by the Navy midshipmen. What a special day! And thank y'all again for bringing this to America. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Enjoy the game. And uh, we will now take a, a live look and listen as the Brigade of Midshipmen marches onto the field here in Philadelphia and listen to Midshipman Paul Westland take you through the March On ceremony. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, now entering the stadium, your United States Naval Academy Brigade of Midshipmen. More than 4,000 men and women of the brigade are organized into two regiments, six battalions, and 30 companies. Each company is designated by a Navy blue and gold guide-on flag. These midshipmen represent every state in the Union, its territories, and 37 foreign countries. The brigade is commanded by Midshipman Captain Jean-Luc Curry of Mobile, Alabama. The Naval Academy Band is under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Bruce McDonald. The drum major is Chief Musician Todd Nix. The 1st Regiment is commanded by Midshipman Commander Justin Chalk of Honolulu, Hawaii. The 1st Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander Haley Novak of Manassas, Virginia. The 1st Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Andrew Mills of Traverse City, Michigan. The 2nd Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Kyle Lynch of Lake Angeles, Michigan. The 3rd Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Andrew Nessel Road of Wilmington, North Carolina. Fourth Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Austin Patrick of Santa Barbara, California.
5th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Junior Grade Alex Clark of Friendswood, Texas. The 2nd Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander James Muscoviak of Silverdale, Washington. The 6th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant John Muscoviak of Silverdale, Washington. Seventh Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Andrew Geisler of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Eighth Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant John Blum of San Bernardino, California. Ninth Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Andrew Miller of Abingdon, Maryland. The Tenth Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Kyle Steenberg of Rochester, New York. The 3rd Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander Curtis Cole of Vienna, Virginia. The 11th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Eamon McCary of San Diego, California. Commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Matthew Lanou of Annapolis, Maryland. Thirteenth Company is commanded by Midshipman Second Class Evan Davis of Corona, California. The 14th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Daniel Chauvin of Reston, Virginia. The 15th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Andrew Robinson of Madison, Mississippi. The 2nd Regiment is commanded by Midshipman Commander Philip Weirs of Fairfax Station, Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, as the colors pass before you, please rise. After they have passed, please be seated. The color guard is comprised of six Midshipmen, Midshipman First Class Wind carrying our national flag, Midshipman First Class Patel carrying the Brigade of Midshipman Flag, Midshipman First Class Zablocki with the battle color of the United States Marine Corps, and Midshipman First Class Prowl carrying the battle color of the United States Navy. The riflemen are Midshipman First Class Espino and Midshipman First Class Seda. The color guard is commanded by Midshipman First Class Chipurco. Fourth Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander Caitlin Olson of Los Gatos, California. Sixteenth Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Bonnie Alford of Spokane, Washington. 17th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Ryan Comer of Newark, New York. 18th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Sarah Alexander of Sanford, Maine. 19th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Benjamin Berkey of Chappaqua, New York. 20th Company, the Color Company. Commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Allison Schwinn of Seaford, Delaware. The Midshipmen of the Color Company have distinguished themselves as the most proficient in the brigade in areas of academics, military, and naval skill. 5th Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander Margaret Gilroy of Hillsborough, New Jersey. 21st Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Gavin Snyder. Verna Park, Maryland. 
The 22nd Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Junior Grade Jesse Burroughs of Lavina, Montana. The 23rd Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Michael Troncoso of Avon Lake, Ohio. The 24th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Chris Rajagopalan of Houston, Texas. The 25th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Benjamin Huggins of Austin, Texas. The 6th Battalion is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Commander Brian Holloway of West Windsor, Vermont. The 26th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Silas Grosh of Middleton, Wisconsin. The 27th Company is commanded by Midshipman Lieutenant Thomas McElwee of Wayne, Pennsylvania. The 28th Company is commanded by Machim Lieutenant Junior Grade Kyle All of Reno, Nevada. The 29th Company is commanded by Machim Lieutenant Carissa Kleinschmidt of Chesapeake, Virginia. And the 30th Company is commanded by Machim Lieutenant Christopher Lohman of Matthews, North Carolina. The Naval Academy Pipes and Drums are commanded by First Class James Thomas. Naval Academy Drum and Bugle Corps is commanded by Machim Lieutenant Brianna French of Woodbridge, Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, the Brigade of Midshipmen.
The U.S. Naval Academy Brigade of Midshipmen marching onto the field here in Philadelphia and will shortly be marching off, taking their seats as we get set for the 114th Army-Navy game, America's game, coming up on your CBS stations at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, great to have two uh, special people joining me and Randy here up on the flight deck, Marine Corps Colonel Bobby Shea, the Deputy Commandant at the U.S. Naval Academy, and we have a major issue to discuss with you shortly, uh, as well as firsty Brian Colby. He's from Chicago. He can handle the Windy City here in uh, Philadelphia a little bit. How are you? Doing great, sir. Happy to be here. Uh, it is great to have you guys with us. Uh, Colonel, there's, there's been much discussion about the fact that this is final exams week. In fact, there's been exams this past week heading into next week as, uh, as the Navy guys try to make it 12 straight over Army. It sounds like they're not getting too much sleep. Well, I would tell you one of the reasons why midshipmen come to the Naval Academy is for a challenge. So <laughs> exams, Army week, all on top of each other, I think the midshipmen can handle it. Hey, what is it? What has the mood been like around just around school with the guys on the team? I know, you, it, like you said, it's finals week, but there's got to be a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of confidence after all the success of late. Yes, sir, absolutely. You know, after studying's over for the day and all of our tests are done, there's a lot of spirit missions going on and a lot of enthusiastic cheering and rooting our team on to victory. What made you want to join the Navy? What made you want to uh, make this commitment? I, I was reading up about you. I heard that you, you wanted to be an astronaut, which is what a lot of kids say when they're, saying maybe five years old. But you're, you, you have followed that path. What made you want to come to the Naval Academy? Well, back in third grade, you know, I, I read a lot of books uh, and I decided, you know, after reading about space, that just was amazing to me. I thought it'd be really cool to be an astronaut someday. And going into high school, I, you know, read up on how to do that. Uh, and being a military pilot was probably the most fun and, uh, and best way to do that. So I decided to join the Naval Academy, hope to be a Navy pilot, and just got assigned Navy pilot after graduation. So Congratulations. I'm on my way. You're, you're, you're halfway there. The, <laughs> you the, sky, the sky is not the limit for you. Uh, Colonel, you have lived a life of some amazing experiences already. You were enlisted in the Marines before even attending the Naval Academy. You, you've been all over the world. Uh, and then I was reading that you were the first female Marine to be a White House fellow uh, following 9-11. Uh, what was that experience like? I will tell you, um, you know, it, it was a tough time for our country, absolutely. But um, to be a Marine, if you're not going to be serving in combat, serving your nation, trying to defend the homeland, is probably one of the highest callings that, that we have. And uh, certainly, you know, a young girl from New Hampshire never thought hmm. that I would, one, even go to college, um, much less serve in the White House. But, you know, these are the type of experiences. and how we're able to push people towards their potential and find out what folks' boundaries are at the Naval Academy. It's just exciting to be a part of it again. Yeah, I was going to say, what is it, how do you describe it to friends and family and people you meet being around all these great young men and women and around this academy? You know, as I said, it's, it's about the word potential. You know, so many of these young kids, they come and they, they're trying to discover what their boundaries are, whether to be an astronaut or to lead Marines in combat. Maybe they're not quite sure they can do it, but we surround them with a whole host of great mentors who can teach them, yeah, you can do it. And more importantly, hopefully when Brian and folks like that get out in the fleet, they can do it for a young sailor or a Marine like somebody did it for me. And, and Brian, you you are something. Uh, you know, we're out here making little jokes about the cold, but there's people who aren't handling it too well who might not have a lot of food to eat, uh, especially during the winter, or a hot meal especially. Tell me, tell me about this group that you are the president of, the, the Midshipman Action Group, and what you guys have been able to do, please. Yes, sir. So uh, the Midshipman Action Group is the Brigade's community service organization, and we have about 100 midshipman leaders who run about 50 or 60 different service projects. And as you mentioned, uh, one of our projects was is called the Harvest for the Hungry uh, Food Drive. So for Thanksgiving, you know, we set a goal to surpass every year in the past. Last year we raised 15,000 pounds of food. We set a goal this year for every company to raise 1,000 pounds, which would have been 30,000. We crushed our goal. We raised 61,000 pounds wow. for wow. the Anne Arundel County Food Bank. And uh, that's going to feed a lot of hungry families this holiday season. Well, we appreciate everything that you do, everything that both of you do. Uh, Brian and Colonel, please uh, enjoy the game, stay warm, and uh, we'll see if Navy makes it a dozen now uh, over Army. And we appreciate your time and, and your service to our country. Thank Thanks you, Thanks for having us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
We will continue here with our live march on coverage as the Brigade of Midshipmen heads down into the tunnel once again here in Philadelphia. The Army and Navy March On Live, presented by USAA, continues here on CBS Sports Network. Many more guests still to come with our coverage continuing until 2.30 Eastern Time. Mine was... between Army and Navy. This was the leadership challenge crossing an imaginary river. Not advisable to use the Delaware this time of year. Navy won this one as well. They brought the two by fours, Randy. They're used to the water. That's not fair. They had their supplies ready to go and uh, Navy came out on top in that chapter of the Patriot Games here in Philadelphia where 84 times after today this game will have been played in the 114 total and uh, Navy as you see has won 11 straight but before that winning streak Randy they they trailed the all-time series yeah and this very much has been a, a a series of late like Aaron said originally it's been about turnovers it's been about putting the ball on the ground and so uh, we of course are getting closer and closer to kick off the countdown to America's game presented by USAA just under two hours until time uh, to kick things off here. So many uh, friends and family in attendance. I, I was told that the uh, that the grandson of Admiral Henry Maws, who was the, once the commander of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, uh, his grandson is a plebe here uh, who was just in the march on that we got to witness once again. Yeah, it's family. It, how, it's amazing when you study these rivalries or this rivalry, how many families and how far back it goes. It's fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers. And, and in fact, there are five sets of brothers on both teams. Uh, Navy and Army each have five sets of brothers. We talk about this being a sibling rivalry. There's a couple of siblings rivalries uh, within each roster. In fact, Navy has a uh, wave runner. Yeah, is his wa name? Wa wave and blaze rider. Oh, rider, right. Yes. W wave rider might need an, an ice breaker uh, by the time this, this one is over. Uh, Randy and I will be seeing you guys uh, outside in just a few minutes here now that the march on has concluded. Our coverage going up until 2.30 as we send things back out to Brent Stover and the guys and the players are getting on the field now. All right, guys, thank you very much. Just outside of Lincoln Financial Field, a, a tradition, really, when you talk about sports at any level, it is one of the great traditions in all of college sports, the Army-Navy March on. From what you saw, your first experience here, Houston, being live at the Army-Navy March on, your reaction to that? It's just unbelievable, Brent. I, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, where the as a coach you always want discipline you want togetherness when they march in there's not a step out of place not one step uh, my father-in-law uh, was in the Navy a brother-in-law Lance Thomas in the Navy Brandon Willis a cousin in the Navy and then an uncle Bill Willis in the Army Army vet and they're servers and I listened to the interview that Adam Zucker did with Colonel Bobby Shea you just get a sense of they know how to give and they know how to serve and what did the Secretary of Navy say? When they leave here today, they go pro to defend our country. I, I mean, that's drop the mic, right? Bam. <laughs> You're done there. I mean, but, but that's what I saw as discipline. I mean, I would have been kicked out on day three just having an iron shirt. I mean, that wasn't going to be able to happen. But, I mean, the bottom line is these kids are so disciplined when you see them. I was out in the parking lot earlier. They were running around, goofing around, chap button. But when it was time to get down to business, they locked in and did what they need to do. And you got to, as an offensive coach, a appreciate that synchronicity in lockstep unified discipline unbelievable pretty impressive stuff and this is my second year in a row it is outstanding hey guys 50 years ago our nation uh, was sent into shock and mourning following the assassination of president john f kennedy marching on 1963 army navy remembered it airs tomorrow once again at 8 a.m as well as 7 p.m on cbs sports network examines who we were as a country in the days following kennedy's death with a focus on that year's army navy game which was played two weeks later here now an excerpt from that show 
After the president was assassinated, we were alerted that there was consideration being given to whether the game should be played at all. Everything was being canceled after John F. Kennedy's death and the Army-Navy game being part of that. But Jackie Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, the whole family just knew how much Jack loved the Army-Navy game. Jacqueline Kennedy's opinion was what swayed the thing. She felt the president would want that game played, that that was important to him, and therefore it was important to her and it was important to the country. She was the voice of the country at that point. So because of all that, it made it much more than just another football game. In a sense, it was President Kennedy's game. We told them we want to play a game fit for a president. We had to celebrate his life. With the blessing of the First Lady, the Army-Navy game was rescheduled for Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 15 days after the assassination. Organizers planned it as a solemn event, devoid of the game's customary fanfare. When I got out there, it was complete silence, and I'd never experienced that in a football game in my life. It was almost eerie. The brigade, the cadets, the teams, the people that would be in attendance were still unsure how to act. It was still a strange feeling that they were still within this cloud of melancholy. But I will say that at that point, the kickoff took place, and quite frankly, I think most every athlete on that field and most every person in that stadium put aside the morning and played the game. Ronnie's this way, right to the five, touchdown! By that fourth quarter, the noise level at Municipal Stadium started growing and growing and growing and growing. The emotion of the uh, loss of the president really came out in the stands. As a player on the field, there's no way you can avoid sensing and seeing that something very special and different is happening. It was one of those rare moments where you can feel the dark cloud lifting, that people were recognizing that life was joyous, that we can feel and, and not bottle up our emotions. That's certainly what President Kennedy would have wanted. He was a huge football fan and a great supporter of the game. It was a statement that we're going to go on. And I really believe that there was solace in the normalcy of this football contest. And that it was going on. Not only was going on, but we were going on. And we were going to be OK. That is absolutely a must-watch show produced by Jack Ford. And the spirit of Army-Navy football extends beyond today's game. In mid-November, Joint Base Lewis McCord and Navy Region Northwest got together for the 14th annual NW Army versus Navy flag football game. The game pits soldiers and airmen against sailors, Coast Guardsmen, and Marines in a nine-on-nine semi-contact matchup. As a young boy, I always wanted to serve the country in some way or the other, and this gave me the opportunity. We've been going on 14 years with this Army-Navy game. It's more than just a football game. It's uh, two branches of the United States military. This rivalry is pretty fierce. It's tradition, Army against Navy. We get together for a game, but it's also a chance for the different services to do something together. The game is a game and it's competitive, but after the game, we shake hands and we all know we're one. We're armed forces. Go Navy, beat Army. Most definitely, we're gonna win. Go Army, beat Navy. Army gonna win. Mine was our Inside College Football Army Navy March On on CBS Sports Network is being brought to you by USAA, proudly serving the financial needs of current and former military members and their families. Here at Lincoln Financial Field in the Patriot Games. We've been talking about them throughout this show. 
And this is the pull-up challenge. Using whatever strategy you want, you have five minutes to do as many pull-ups as possible. Everybody must complete at least one pull-up. Just one of these Patriot games, Army versus Navy. Army coach was able to win this one. I'll tell you what, it looks tough. Just looking at it now, I don't know if I can do one. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's, I know it's competitive, you can see. I, I was more of a flex arm hang guy back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> he's cheating on those pull-ups, he? he's cheating, he's kipping. And that's the voice of Clint Bruce, and he's definitely, I guarantee you, Clint Bruce, he can knock out a few pull-ups. 1996, he was the captain of Navy. I didn't realize this till today, or maybe I just forgot. You guys were a top 20 defense. Yeah, we had a great bunch of players. We had some great staff at the time. Dick Bumpus was our D coordinator. Uh, Brian Norwood, who's down at Baylor now. Tommy Ray. We just had some wonderful coaches and some players that loved each other a whole lot and didn't like anybody between us and who we were trying to where we were trying to get. Hey, your resume is pretty impressive. You were a Navy SEAL as well, so we won't make you go top secret with us at all. But in terms of your experience when you were a player and now coming back as a fan can you speak to both of those a little bit yeah i tell you it's it's an interesting thing one the, the kids today on both sides of the field they're just amazing athletes i mean I, you know i don't know that i would have seen the field if i played for the navy team now um but i used to think that everything i ever needed to know about life i learned on the football field and then i became a seal and i realized that everything i need to know about life i learned on the football field and then i became a businessman i realized that everything i need to know about life i learned on the football field so this is home for me in a lot of ways to kind of see these things that are true out in the real world and I learned them on the field. Clint, you've been attributed to one of the best quotes I've ever heard to be able to describe this game, and that was, show me another game where everyone playing is willing to die and sacrifice for everyone watching. It's very rare that we yeah. get a chance to be able to hear what the genesis from a quote that really does so aptly describe such a game. Where did that come from? Well, it was really, I was getting I was getting interviewed asking about rivalries and some of these other things, and I, I kind of listened. I said, hey, well, what do you think is the best rival? And they listed all these great ones, you know, Notre Dame, Stanford, Texas, so you, I grew up in Little Rock where it was Southwest Conference it was Arkansas Texas and and I kind of listened I said listen no disrespect intended and, and I'm not trying to be rude but we stand apart we're different and he goes why I said well you show me another game where everyone playing is one die for everybody watching and, and I'll admit that we have peers in this rivalry and and it's not a disrespect to the other games but I believe we're unique in what we're willing to do for the man next to us willing to do once we graduate for the person we just played against and what we're certainly willing to do for the people watching us from the stands and TV. You played for Coach Weatherby, yes. Dick Bumpus, yeah. Richard Bell. You played for some great coaches. And you know, you got this name, kind of a, a throwback guy. Is there any linebacker on that Navy football team that kind of reminds you of yourself? Well, I like, uh, you know, I, I kind of am the patron saying the linebackers. I look over them, and I'm real careful on who gets to wear 51. If he, You know, if he's got all his teeth, that's a strike against him. He's got to be real tough. I look for missing teeth. Um, but, you know, I think all the kids right now are, are, are there. I, this is a really tough, smart kids, so it's hard to choose. Clint, we talked about the pageantry of this rivalry and how significant it is. But at the end of the day, when you were playing, you're also just a bunch of group of guys. I was with a couple of your former teammates that said that you look like more like a Navy walrus than a Navy SEAL nowadays. I like, I like to say I'm a cold water. I'm a cold weather frog man. I'm, <laughs> I'm built for this. This is really my environment. I'm a, I'm a downhill cold weather frog. So, insecurity makes guys say stuff like that all the time. I feel sorry for them, but they're just doing the best they can with what they have. Clint, this is my first experience. Oh, really? I got to sit in the living room in Little Rock many a days and watch this game. Right. But uh, to be here, take me through about, as a player, what it's like getting ready for this game today. Well, and that's all I've ever done. This is the first game, or first Army-Navy game I've ever come to and watched. I mean, I was fortunate to play as a freshman my, my whole career and be on the field and you know, it's a little bit overwhelming that that very first year when you're there and, uh, you know, a, a Medal of Honor recipient walks by you and then a, a Roger Staubach walks by and then, you know, one of my favorites, Chet Muller, who uh, walks by and it's a little bit starstruck. And then you settle down and you're like, hey, it, at some point in time, the whistle's going to blow. Someone's going to try to hit me and I got to hit them. And it's just football. Outstanding. Clint Bruce, he was the Navy captain back in 1996. Appreciate your time outstanding. You and best of luck to you going Thank you forward. very much. I appreciate it. All right, it's Army and Navy, Navy. over on CBS. Had to slide that in over on <laughs> CBS. Coming up at 3 p.m. Eastern. Up next here on CBS Sports Network, we are all coming right back for Army, Navy, tailgate. Stay with us. We're coming right back to Philadelphia after this break. Got it. Got it.